If you want to watch the original director's cut of this video and many others, then check out my Patreon. Director's cut just means that it is the video in the way that I wanted to make it, not in the way that I had to make it to get around YouTube blocking me from releasing it to you guys. So if you're interested in a better edited video with better music and talking about scenes specifically, showing examples and walking you through them, that is where you're going to find that. If you want to check out what is, in my opinion, some of my best work and support the channel, there will be a link to it. But as always, enjoy the video. Quick little disclaimer before we begin this video, I am recovering from either the worst cold I've had in my life or pneumonia. So if this video comes out, it means I'm still alive. Yay. If my voice sounds a little bit scuffed, that's why. Enjoy the video. Treasure Planet is both by far and away the best film to ever come from Disney and is better than Treasure Island and it's not even close. Okay, it's like in the top five Disney films ever made and it's definitely better than Treasure Island. Like that part's not even close. But for the sake of YouTube, it's fun to say extreme things. Sue me. Treasure Planet is a passion project film from some of the best minds, specifically the best duo mind to ever work at Disney. And I like talking about passion projects because it shows in the caliber of the story, the writing, the visuals, the character arcs, okay, just everything. There is so much to unpack about this movie from the controversy around its release, the use of deep canvas and how expensive the film was, the theories surrounding the film's downfall and quick fall into obscurity, and the incredible decisions that were made to adapt the original work, taking the simple idea of Treasure Island, but space, and improving on the original story in almost every single way possible along the way. And I know that last sentence is gonna piss a lot of book nerds off, but hear me out. Starting from the very first scene, Disney is known for its storybook openings, Beauty and the Beast, Robin Hood. Having a storybook narrator telling us the world, it just, it makes sense, it feels homey, you know? But Treasure Planet introduces an immediate twist. Jim is reading the book. It's not just being told to us as the audience. We are introduced to our protagonist as a wide-eyed kid who fantasizes about being a spacer, this universe's version of being a pirate. And I love this twist because it's almost a subtle wink to the audience that this won't be a traditional Disney film, as in many ways it's not. It's a much more grown-up Disney movie than we've come to expect, with themes of abandonment, self-doubt, death, Grief. I mean, this movie covers some heavy ground, and it sends this message to the audience while also setting up the world in which the story exists. And speaking of the world, this is, in my opinion, perfect steampunk. I guess it's not really true steampunk, whatever steampunk is as a definition, I don't care. It's 70% old world and 30% sci-fi. We see this immediately from everything. We have a galley flying in space with pirates dressed as pirates shooting laser pistols. It's a perfect blend that just somehow makes sense, and it flows through every decision used in the film. This is a universe where we have talking books and flying spaceships and laser guns and clothes from the 1800s and open exposed beams and woodwork. like. For some reason, my brain is just like, yeah, this works, this makes sense. And the 70-30 rule even extends to every decision in the movie, including the music, but I'm getting ahead of myself there. Back in Jim's room, we get to see a heart-melting scene between Jim and his mom. Oh, it's a scene that's just too real and wholesome for my jaded, cold heart. This builds a huge connection between Jim and his mom, Sarah, that honestly is just kind of missing from the original Treasure Island. Uh, to recap, in one scene alone, we now know that this won't be a traditional Disney movie. We know and understand the world in which the story takes place in. We see how close Jim and his mother Sarah are to each other, which lays the groundwork for Jim's entire character arc for the rest of the film. And it does all of this in 3 minutes and 40 seconds. God, I love airtight writing. This scene also ends with one of the goddamn smoothest transitions in Disney history leading to a scene where we get to see deep canvas in motion and just how gorgeous of a film we are in for. What is deep canvas, you might ask? Well, let me introduce you to the coolest, most expensive art project that Disney has ever made. Ever wonder how in Tarzan they painstakingly hand-painted the forest that Tarzan glides through? 
Well, they didn't. Yeah, at least not exactly. Deep Canvas was a software that allowed modelers to go in and model the space that the 2D hand-drawn animated characters were going to be interacting with. Once done, they would pass it along to the animators, who would then do a rough draw of the characters passing through the scene. Now we go back to the modelers, who flesh out the background and everything that the characters don't directly interact with in 3D space, and it gets passed to the painters! who painstakingly paint every point in focus that will be directly interacted with by our characters. After they finish, it's passed on to background painters who would then paint everything not being interacted with in the background to flesh out the world. Once they were done, it was then passed back to the 2ED animators who would then hand draw the characters into the scene and finalize the shot. It was an expensive, labor-intensive process that took the resources of multiple different departments. But the results speak for themselves. I mean, just look at how gorgeous these shots are. Gorgeous and expensive. While you could quickly produce incredible shots that would take ages to do hand-drawn, in theory, you could also do the same thing with one department, a 3D animation department. Which, while it doesn't look nearly as good, 3D animation at the time in the early 2000s was quicker and cheaper. Which I don't need to tell ya, the House of Mouse does not exactly like expensive to produce content, which may have led to the film's downfall. Whoops, did I say that out loud? This film even goes the extra step of having 2D animated characters with 3D animated parts, such as Silver, whom all of his cyborg parts are 3D animated. So much like a cyborg, he is half 2D animated and half 3D animated. And then all of that is put into a deep canvas environment. Which, oh yeah, have I mentioned that yet? This entire film is shot in deep canvas. Like every shot. Okay, not every shot, but almost every shot. Almost every scene uses deep canvas to give us one of the most stunning animated movies ever made full stop. This alone would have been enough to push it into some of the greatest movies I've ever seen category for me. But then they had to go ahead and make some of the smartest writing adaption decisions I have ever seen in a film and write a better story than a classic book. And they did this by centering on a key relationship between two characters. After a wonderful little romp, we are brought back to the Benbow Inn. And we can visually see the toll that Sarah has taken, and I'm not gonna lie, these scenes hurt. She's doing her best to keep the inn running, but it's running her ragged. To add to this, Jim feels like he's letting her down. He feels like we all did at that age. A fuck up. A loser with no future. And somebody who will never live up to the expectations put on him. You can just feel the guilt oozing from him in every scene as he feels like he's letting his mother down. Ugh! We also get our second major story change. Jim's father abandoned him and his mother at an early age, leading to an absence of a father figure in his life. This detail puts so much into the story. Continuing on with the story, it plays out as you would expect. Billy Bones shows up, gives the map to Jim, the inn burns down, Jim goes on a journey to find the lost treasure, but this time we have the added weight of Jim and his mother's relationship behind it. And we have the context of Jim wanting to prove himself to his mother and those nagging, deep-seated feelings of guilt. Because, oh yeah, did I mention that now he's also blaming himself for the inn burning down? Yeah. Jim's adventure now carries so much more weight and meaning to it. It's not just a carefree coming-of-age adventure. This is now about family and about making good on the guilt that you feel towards those family members, as well as being a journey to find yourself and your own identity. We then get to meet our crew and our cat... cat lady. <clears throat> what was I saying? What? No, do not look at me like that. They knew exactly what they were doing with Captain Amelia. She was the original cat girl before there was a thing, and you cannot prove me wrong. End of story. And now we get to the most important dynamic of the film, and the biggest departure from the book. 
the relationship between Silver and Jim. Silver is a terrifying, cold-hearted cyborg that is amusingly stuck with looking after a snide, insecure pup. Silver actually ends up saving Jim from a brawl, and the two hit it off from there. In a touching scene following it, Jim opens up to Silver a little bit about not having a father, and you can tell that it shakes Silver as he starts to act differently from what we've seen. He starts to take him under his wing. And in one of the best song sequences in a Disney film, yes, I will die on that hill, we see the two of them bond naturally, and it, it makes sense. Also, remember how I mentioned that 70-30 rule? The whole soundtrack up to this point has been very... Ye olde adventure me hearties yo whole. But in a pivotal moment, instead of getting more of that, we get a contemporary song that then shows Jim's father leaving and Silver stepping in to fill that void in his life. Anyway, stellar action scene later, we come to the scene that defines the movie for me and one that I constantly come back to and remember and the scene that makes Treasure Planet better than the original Treasure Island. After a tragic scene where one of Silver's crew members kills Mr. Arrow and then places the blame on Jim, we see all of Jim's newfound confidence leave him. For the first time, Jim was finally coming out of his shell. We got to see him be confident and sure of his worth, only for it all to come crashing back down again. And I think what makes this scene so effective for me is the captain's reaction. She doesn't yell at Jim. She doesn't reproach him. She just is silent. And honestly, that hurts way more. Cue Silver and Jim on the deck in the stars. I, I don't know what else to call this scene. Silver comforts Jim? We'll go with that. Silver tries to cheer up the boy as any father would, saying it could have happened to anyone that it wasn't his fault, and if it wasn't for him, all of them would be floating up in space. But Jim explodes and yells at Silver, telling him about how much of a failure he is and how he's destined to always be a failure. Silver can't take it anymore. He sets Jim straight and well, yeah, <laughs> I tear up every time. We know Silver is the villain. We know he's going to betray Jim, and yet, for that one moment, we hope that everything is going to be okay. We convince ourselves that Silver has changed because in many ways he has. And for Jim, this moment is everything. This is the first time that somebody, at least that we have seen, has straight out told him of his potential and that they believe in him. In this one moment, Silver provides everything that Jim was lacking in a father, and more. And speaking of visual storytelling, because I get my rocks off to that, in the first half of the film, Jim is always slouching and wearing black. And on top of that, there's this shading effect over his eyes as if he always has his head held down. But as he's gaining confidence under Silver, we start to see him wear more beige and more cream tones, more neutral colors, and the shadow over his eyes starts to fade. But then when the arrow event happens, all of it comes back. The black comes back on, the shadow is back there. But after Silver interacts with him, we see it vanish. And we see Jim take on this newfound confidence, this time in himself. Ah, oh, this scene is just so good. And it sets up perfectly for the gut punch that comes right after it. Now is when the story starts to pick up speed. After a heart-touching scene where we get to see Silver's humanity, we are reminded of the fact that Silver is still in fact the villain of the story. Hiding in a barrel, Jim overhears the plans of mutiny, much like the book. Along with Silver renouncing everything that he just told Jim the night before. Unlike the book. Just, just think about this from the point of view of Jim for a second. He finally has somebody in his life that believes in him, only to have that torn away from him not even eight hours later. I mean, can this poor kid catch a break anywhere? Unlike the book, this makes the mutiny and the betrayal of Silver hurt. 
and it's a hundredfold more effective than the original story because of the built connection between Silver and Jim. It's not even close! We're just gonna skip forward a bit here as the rest of the story plays out much like the book. Honorable shout out to Dilbert though, because he is fucking hilarious and really comes into his own in the later third of this movie. The film is capped off with, again, more gorgeous shots that seamlessly blend 2D animated characters with 3D animated elements in deep canvas environments. It's just stunning. And the final action sequence just mwah. In a penultimate action sequence, we get to see Silver finally make his decision of what kind of a man he wants to be. And we see the completion of his growth as he chooses to save Jim, overtaking the jewel-laden ship filled with treasure that he has been searching for his entire life. And while this is a bit of a tropey, overdone thing of holding the one thing and then going, Oh, here's my hand! Take my hand! It's simple, it's effective, and it's straight to the point. Which is just perfect for Silver's character. And actually, I lied. That wasn't the completion of Silver's arc. This is. This is what finishes both Jim's and Silver's arcs together. What a perfect send-off. Silver again reaffirms Jim, and Jim shows him that he finally believes in himself. And to top it off, Silver again goes out of his way for a selfless act, throwing Jim jewels to rebuild his mother's inn. Just perfection. This whole film is just perfection. I can really only fault it for one thing, and that's about it. Almost every character is written perfectly. The dynamic between Silver and Jim makes the story punches land a hundred times harder than they did in the original story. And the setting is just one of the best sci-fi settings ever to be created. This film is just a masterpiece. Yes, it is a masterpiece. I am going there. Fuck you, snarky YouTube commenter. I see you typing out your comment right now. This is a masterpiece. I know the definition of masterpiece, and I will die on this hill. So how on earth could one of the best most lovingly created animated films to ever be made, coming from one of the most prestigious companies to ever exist, fail to even make a mark at the box offices and be relegated to obscurity. Disney is a company that makes family films. You know, wholesome, good-feeling entertainment. It's built its whole brand on that image, which means it's come a long way from the money-grubbing roots of a shrewd businessman that didn't particularly like the Jews. Whoops! Did I say that out loud? Jokes and poor taste aside, Disney built itself into being a global titan, not because they make good stuff. I mean, that certainly helps, but because they are a business. A ruthless, cold-hearted business that makes smart business decisions. Like bringing on Ron Clements and John Musker. Granted, the first project the two worked on, The Black Cauldron, almost bankrupted the studio. But kind of in their defense, it wasn't really a film that they wanted to make. They pitched very early on to The House of Mouse that they wanted to make Treasure Island in space. And the execs were hesitant of it, especially after the flop of The Black Cauldron, and they told them that they had to prove themselves, and once they did, they could make their silly little pirate movie. 22 years later, and four of the most classic Disney films ever created, they finally got their chance. Treasure Island in space was greenlit. And much to the company's chagrin, the duo went all out, using deep canvas as we talked about before, to make a stunning picture that cost a hell of a lot of money. So much money, in fact, that many people have speculated that it's the reason for the closing of the 2D animation department at Disney. 2D animation is expensive and time-consuming. 3D animation is quick and cheap to produce. So, moving forward in the early 2000s, Disney wanted to make the shift into 3D animation. But they needed an excuse to jump in head first. And what better way to do that than meddle with this silly little space pirate film? Speaking of film meddling, I'm not going to go into it too much at length, but Ben feels really out of place. And if there was one thing that I could nick this movie for, it would be Ben. And that's also a knock against the original Treasure Island, because we're introduced to a character two-thirds of the way in the story that is central to the plot, and you can't really get around him and his importance in the story, 
So you're just kind of stuck with him, but you're introduced to him so late that you don't really give a shit about him. But it really feels like that the Disney high ups were also yelling at them, telling that the film was not funny enough for a kid's film. So they just kind of forced them to pull a full Jar Jar and just go for the funny equals loud and obnoxious approach to comedy, which again, I kind of feel like was a mouse meddling issue. But again, I digress. Other things that you can do to kill a media property on launch is to market it in the worst way possible, give it the worst possible trailers, and give it the toughest competition it could possibly have at the box office. Releasing November 27th, 2002, alongside Harry Potter and the Chamber of Fucking Secrets. You know, the follow-up to one of the biggest film series ever since Star Wars? Die Another Day, which was terrible, but it's still a Bond film, and Disney's own The Santa Claus 2 at Christmas time. Why was this film released at Christmas? This could have been one of the greatest summer blockbusters of all time. I'm not saying that Disney pulled a Titanfall 2 on Treasure Planet, but it is mysterious that immediately after the flop, Disney shut down Deep Canvas to never be used again, and shortly thereafter closed the 2D animation department. Just saying. Treasure Planet is an absolute mastercraft in how it adapts its source material and not only faithfully captures the spirit of the original story, something that I talked about at length in the Dune and Witcher video, but it also manages to improve on a classic story with a few simple changes. The relationship and the scenes between Silver and Jim just put this movie far and above away most movies. And honestly, it puts it up there for me as one of my all-time favorite films. Thankfully, thanks to the work of Bread Sword, Rowan J. Coleman, and others from around the online space, Treasure Planet has had a bit of a revival in recent years. More and more people are becoming aware of this early 2000s classic. And damn it, I want to throw my voice into the void of the internet because this film holds a special place in my heart. And by Tunder, I want it to hold a special place in yours as well. If I ever do decide to have children, which the thought of bringing children into a world this broken is a terrifying thought, this movie is going to be one that I introduce to them early on. It doesn't have the perfect role models with spotless valor like so many other kids' movies. It has real characters doing their best to hold each other up. It also has some of the best, most emotional speeches to ever come from Disney and some of the best messages and themes. And is probably, in my opinion, one of, if not the best Disney coming of age movie. It's just a damn good movie. If that day ever comes, so be it. Until then, with Gimlet in hand, I will continue to enjoy this film by myself over and over if only to hear the message coming from Silver one more time. Hey, that ending was kind of cool, right? Um, if you want to get to know me a little bit more, I don't know why you would want to, but um, you can check out Flying Walrus Live, and chances are I'll probably be on there live streaming, and you can ask me some really dumb questions, or really interesting questions. I really don't care. But um, yeah, I'll see you there.